so here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 10, it's kind of an interesting story of, of this man named Jehu, who was one of the kings over, um, over Israel. And you'll notice a lot of times in the Old Testament, you know, there's a lot of bloodshed. There's a, there's a lot of, sometimes it's, it's kind of, I don't want to say graphic, but it's, you know, we see here like the people that he killed. But what I want to point out, just in, in getting started here in this story, uh, it's the, this is kind of a springboard to what the sermon's really about, but we notice he killed a lot of people, right? He had, uh, and we didn't read this in a, in a previous chapter, he ends up killing Ahab. Ahab was the king of Israel before Jehu. Jehu kills Ahab, and that's why then later he sends out to all of Ahab's household and says, okay, you know, Ahab's dead. Why don't you, you know, make whoever you want to make king? Because that's normally what they would do in secession. They would have the king, the, you know, the son of whoever the king was, was kind of taken over as a hereditary rule. Even though that's not necessarily the way it should have been, that's the way they were doing it. So he says, okay, go ahead, make whoever you want to have king and send them out to me. You know, basically they, they would fight and get, and get, this, get this settled, who was going to be king, who was going to be in charge. And they said, you know, he's already killed, because he had already killed two kings. So these people were afraid and they're like, well, we don't want to go up against him. You know, he's already killed two kings. So, so they answer and say, well, no, no, we'll just do whatever you say. You could, you, could, you, could, you could be our king, we'll serve you, and that's fine. Well, the problem is, especially with the kings, and you, and you notice this all throughout the Bible, and just not even throughout the Bible, a king can't have a threat to his throne, right? Uh, someone that's going to be there to, to threaten, you know, his, his position of authority. So oftentimes what you have, especially when, when families change, is they'll wipe out all, anyone who would be in line to be king so that later on there's not you know, this subversive act to, to overthrow the kingdom and to take it away from, from the person that's reigning. If you remember with King Solomon, when, when the kingdom was taken away from the house of David, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, because Solomon had, had you know, built all these altars of the false gods, God punished him for that. But he didn't do it in Solomon's days. Rehoboam, his son, became king. And then in Rehoboam's days is when God took away like almost all of Israel from him. And it was basically Judah. And, you know, it was like two and a half tribes that, that was down in Judah that, that he was reigning over. And that's when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, became king over Israel. And when, when Israel was split into two sections. And... At that time, Jeroboam was, was afraid that the people were going to go back under the rule of Rehoboam. And that after a while, you know, at first they were upset with Rehoboam because he was being real hard on them. He wasn't lightening up on their load. That Solomon had the people working real hard. And they, they went to him and they're like, you know, please just, just lighten our load a little bit and we'll serve you. And he didn't do it and, and he didn't listen to good counsel and that was from the Lord because God was going to strip away his kingdom from him. And um, so the kingdom was divided. But then Jeroboam was, was afraid. Even though the Lord had, had given him and established him as king, he was afraid that the people would end up going back and they'd want to serve the house of David. So he made up these, these false, these, these idols. To serve, And he said, you know, serve the Lord here. So he wasn't like changing the God to be Baal, which is what we see in this chapter. People were serving Baal. Baal is just, it's a completely different God, a false God. It's Satan basically is what it is. Any, any false God is, is of Satan. It's not serving the Lord. But Jeroboam didn't go as far as to say that this is a completely separate God, but he made these golden images, these golden calves. And basically said that they were God, but he, he called it the Lord. And, you know, he made all the same fe you know, feasts at the same times. And then he completely, completely changed things and just went against the word of the Lord. But he was worried that if the people went to worship in Jerusalem, that they would, you know, in their hearts go back to, well, maybe Rehoboam should just be king over all of us. And he didn't want that to happen. So that's why he did what he did. Now, Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that was, that's something that's mentioned like all throughout these books of the kings of how wicked that was and how bad he was for doing that and, and how much that drove the people away from serving God. But I kind of went off a little bit on a tangent. The reason why I did that is because he was worried about his kingdom. And 
in order for Jehu to establish himself, he didn't want any of these other children of Ahab to come up later and for people to, to get rallied behind him and have this big problem later on. So he says, okay, if you guys are really going to serve me, then you need, to, you need to kill all of the sons of Ahab and prove it by basically you know, sending their heads in a basket. And they did it. They said, okay. So then when he confronts them, he says, okay, now you judge. You know, I, cons I made a conspiracy against, against Ahab when he was, because he was Jehu's king, and he killed him. So it's like, you know, it's treasonous, it's a treasonous act to, to kill the king. But he said, but now look at you. So who's, basically he's saying, you know, who's going to come and hold me responsible for committing this act when you've now just killed all of the sons of the king? So, so he's kind of, you know, bought himself a little bit of, uh, of, of grace there, if you will, because now they're in the same boat that he is. They're just as guilty as he is for doing what they did. Um, you know, it was kind of the point to that, but that wasn't the only point. What he was doing was fulfilling the word of God, and he knew it. Because Ahab was a really wicked king. He was an extremely wicked king in God's eyes. And he did all kinds of things that were even worse than what Jeroboam the son of Nebat did. And... God proclaimed against Ahab that all of his children, his whole household was going to be destroyed because of what Ahab did. So what Jehu ended up doing was fulfilling the word of the Lord. And you can see that. Look at verse number 10. He says, Know now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. And what he's referring to is when Elijah prophesied against Ahab, saying that none of your children are going to be left alive. Your house is going to be left desolate. So we see here, Jehu was real, even though you could say he's real bloody, you know, there's, there's, there's all these deaths and, and killings going on, he was fulfilling God's will. He was fulfilling the word of the law and doing what he's doing. And just like the children of Israel did when God sent them into the promised land. And a lot of people have a hard time with this. That one of, one of the commandments of the Lord was, was to wipe out everybody and everything when they were sent into the promised land. The, the commandment was wipe them all out. Men, women, children, everybody. All of, all of the heathen that were in the land were supposed to be put to death. And that was God's judgment on the nation. And we, we, you know, if you just were to say, you know, God's, God's for, you know, this is what the atheists would do. They'll say, you know, God's for killing babies. Well, of course, that sounds horrible, but that's not the whole story at all, by any means. That is not the whole story. God is not for killing babies, but... There are things that people do that bring judgment. And, and when you do really wicked sins, you bring judgment upon not just yourself, but on a lot of people around you. There's this, you know, you call it collateral damage, if you will, but it's uh, an entire nation was given over. And when you look at the laws, that's what you know, you look through the, read through Levitical, the, the, the law in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the Bible is clear that the people of the land did all of those things. I mean, they were, it goes into like bestiality and all kinds of weird, perverted, sick things. He gave that law and he said, look, every, the people in the land before you did all of these things. They were into that. So, so they had brought all kinds of, you know, it got to the point to where God just said, look, we're wiping them out. Just like he did with the flood. You know, when the flood came in Noah's days, guess what? There were little children, there were infants, there was all kinds of other people on the earth today, but God had to bring his judgment to, to, to wipe out the people because they had gotten so wicked and so far away from him. And it's going to happen again. Okay, God's judgment comes. And we can't say, we can't judge God and say, God, your judgment's perverse. But we, all, and we also can't say, even, even close to that, by, by um, you know, it, it's not that difficult to understand what's going on here. But we see that he's, Fulfilling God's will. And um, now this doesn't mean that it's God's will for you to go out and just murder a bunch of people who are in sin and stuff like that. This is literally the word of the Lord that was prophesied against Ahab. These prophecies aren't coming anymore. You know, this was something that Elijah was alive and he was prophesying and saying, this is going to happen to you. And this is recorded in the Bible. It's God's word. And it was coming to pass. 
This isn't something that's, that's still continuing to happen. We have all of the Word of God. All these events have come to pass. God's, wor God's Word has been proven to be true, and His prophecies have, have always come true. Now, of course, there's still events that haven't happened yet, but it's still been recorded. So it's not like, you know, there's, there's commandments that are ongoing from God to just kill a bunch of people. Now, there's, there's judgments that we are supposed to use in our in our society as a, as a people, in our government, our human government, to be able to, to judge people the way that God would have us to judge people. There are laws that we ought to have against certain crimes, against people who violate other people. There's, there's you know, punishments spelled out in the Bible that I believe are appropriate judgments and appropriate punishments that we ought to be using today and adhering to today. It's found in God's perfect law. I don't have a pro you know, I don't think there's a problem with the way that God ordained for people to be punished. But none of this is saying that, you know, it's right for you to go out and just start killing a bunch of people and say, oh, I'm doing this for God. And, and that's the big leap that, you know, people who want to criticize the Bible will take and say, oh, yeah, you know, they'll, they'll reference some lunatic, some crazy person who goes and, and kills his family and kills all these other people and just says, God made me do it. You know, I heard, I heard God and God told me to do it. And they'll see, see, what makes him different from you? What makes him different? You know, this is what the, the God of the Bible, and they'll bring up these, these other examples. And it's not the same thing at all. Not, not even close. God bringing his judgment against these people and it being well known and well established. And um, it's just, I don't even want to get, I don't even want to get into how ridiculous that is because that's not what the sermon's about at all. I'm getting way off subject in here just trying to explain this story but <laughs> all of that to say this there was a lot that Jehu was doing here now Jehu wasn't perfect and it even says at the end of the chapter he didn't follow him with his whole heart he didn't get rid of those idols that Jeroboam had set up and that was a problem but he did do a lot for God and he served God well and jump down to verse number 15 because as he's going now, he, he starts to, to make this war against the house of Ahab and go to wipe him out because that was the word of the Lord against him. And he's going to fulfill all of God's word. He runs across this man, Jehonadab. Verse 15 says, And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. So he basically runs across this, this man, Jehonadab, and he said, you know, because he's doing all these things, it's going to provoke people one way or the other. You're either going to like what he's doing or you're really going to hate what he's doing. I mean, he's, he's putting people to death. He's killing people here. He's taking very strong actions. He's not like the politicians of today that are like, well, I wonder where he stands on this. I wonder how he feels about Ahab. There's no doubt about it. There's no question. He's going through and he's doing things and he's taking care of business and he's saying, you know, thus saith the Lord and, and he's making things right. Okay? So he, he comes across Jehonadab and saying, okay. He's like, my heart's right with you, Jehonadab. Is your heart right with me? You okay with all this? You see, you, know, you see what's going on? And he answers. He says, it is. Let's keep reading here. He says, if it be. Give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand and he took him up to him into the chariot and he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. And he's saying, well, if your heart's right with me, come with me. He's like, I'm going to show you a thing or two. Come see my zeal for the Lord. And this is all, all of that foundation in this story to preach on our zeal. You know, I'm going to be preaching on see my zeal for the Lord. Jehu is an example here. We read the whole story. Now, his example was one that was a little bit bloody. But I'll tell you what, it takes a lot of guts, it takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of strength to go out and actually go through with the things that he was doing here. This isn't something that, that just anybody would go out and do. Even if it was commanded by God for them to do it, Jehu took, you know, took a step up and he's saying, I'm, gonna, I'm fulfilling God's word here. I'm doing the work of God. And he really was. He wasn't just... just you know, someone saying that. He was fulfilling God's word and bringing the judgment against it, against the house of Ahab. And he says, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. See how much I am serving God and that I am doing for the Lord and what I, and you know, it's a risk. You know, he has to take this on faith that he's doing this and, and it's a big risk that he's doing. And he says, you know, come and, and see what I'm doing. Now, 
I don't think that Jehu put Jehonadab in his chariot to sh just to show off for himself, saying, look at me and look at all the great things that I'm doing. What he's doing is he's saying, hey, let's go serve the Lord together. He's like, I'm going to show you how, how on fire I am for God so that you can serve him too. I think he's showing other people and being that example that he needs to be to serve God. And because I'm going to be preaching on you know, our ze how zealous we are for serving God and that we need to be excited about doing things for God and serving the Lord, we need to make sure that we maintain the right focus with our zeal. Because oftentimes people get really excited about serving God and oftentimes what that does is it draws attention. It'll draw attention to you when you're actually going out and doing a lot of things for the Lord and, and people will see that. And it's great, you know, praise the Lord. You want to be a good example, but don't let the attention that might come your way because, hey, you know, brother so-and-so did this. Look at how great that is. You know, he, he got a lot of people saved here. He's reaching and helping a ton of people out and a lot of people will say, hey, that's great, and encourage them and thank them and, and, and go up and want to talk to them. And, you know, that's just natural when somebody kind of steps up and is starting to lead and is real zealous towards serving God, but you don't want to let that get to your head and start thinking it's all about you and saying, well, I'm so great. You know, I did all of this. I'm helping these people out because I'm so smart and, and I'm so, you know, and, and get that, that full of yourself type of an attitude. In 1 Corinthians 14, when Paul was talking about spiritual gifts and all these things, because think about how great that was. The apostles in the, in the time of the book of Acts, around that time, after Jesus Christ's resurrection, God had endued them with certain powers. I mean, they were healing the sick. They were able to speak with other tongues, speak in other languages they didn't even know. And all these things that were outwardly evident. Things that other people can see because they were serving the Lord. They were doing what God wanted. They were zealous for serving God and they were trying to reach as many people as possible. And God had given them gifts. And what he says in, in 1 Corinthians 14 about regarding these gifts, because other people can look at that and be like, wow, I wish I had that gift. And, and it was good to desire a spiritual gift. And man, I would love to be able to heal people. I would like to do this. But you don't want to, to, to get to the point to where it's about you. You know, the gift is, 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 a, is, 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 is just that. It's a gift. It's something given to you for free. It's not something you've earned or deserved necessarily. You know, it, you know it's not. It's, it's a gift is just given to you for free. You don't earn it. But um, it's to magnify the power of God. In 1 Corinthians 14, 12, the Bible says, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. He's saying, you know, you're real zealous. You want to get these spiritual gifts. You want to do right. He says, but just make sure that you seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church, that, you, that you're there to build up the other people and that you're not just so worried about getting these gifts for yourself. That you're, you're getting the gifts to use them to help out the other people to edify the church. Now, zeal is very infectious. And that's a good thing. In 2 Corinthians 9, actually you could turn there if you'd like. I don't think we're going to go back to, uh, to 2 Kings. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. What I'd like to do, the goal this morning is to try to stir you up to get more zealous for serving, having a zeal to serve God, having that, that going above and beyond and taking that next step to not just want to do it, but to, to take the steps to actually go forth and do something and, and do even more and to have a zeal and to love God so much that you're, you're offering yourself up as a sacrifice saying, God, here I am. Use me. I want to do a lot of work for you. I want to help people out in masses. I want to do as much as I could possibly be do to be used by you, dear Lord, and to have this zeal. Zeal is infectious. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse number 1, the Bible reads, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. He said, it's super, you know, I don't even have to write unto you about 
how well you ministered unto the saints, how well you took care of people, how well you were doing with that job. He's saying, it's superfluous for me to write to you. And he says, because I already know the forwardness. I already know what you're doing and how your zeal has provoked very many. Because you're doing all these great works, because you're ministering unto other people so much, you've provoked other people to do likewise. You're provoking other people. See, oftentimes, all someone needs to get started serving God is they need to see someone else doing it. And that's why you'll see, you'll, oftentimes, there's a, there'll be churches where nobody's going out soul winning. And you might have people and they're wishing, you're like, man, I'd really like to go soul winning. I, I would like to, I'd like to give other people the gospel of Christ, but nobody's doing it. And, and what, all, it, all that's needed in some cases is just one person to say, to just go out and do it and have that zeal. And I'll tell you what, it, it, it's noticeable. I've been in churches where, where almost nobody does, does the soul winning that's doing work for people, is, is really getting involved and helping out in church. But there's the, the one or two people. Because I've gone out and I've visited all kinds of different churches and, and they're easy to spot right away, the people who are zealous for serving God. You spot them out. They love being at church. They love doing all the things. They love all the activities. They love doing everything they possibly can. Why? Because their heart is right with God. Why? Because they want to serve God. And having that zeal rubs off on other people. The more you get around someone like that and you see how excited they are. Man, it was great. We went out today. We talked to this person. You tell them the whole story about how someone gets saved. Hey, that's exciting. That's great to hear. And that rubs off on other people. And so after a while, someone's thinking, you know, man, I haven't done this before, but... It's so exciting. I want to go out and do this. I want to be part of the action. I don't want to just sit on the sidelines. The zeal can be effect effective at provoking other people to do this. I'll give you a good example. Pastor Donnie Romero at uh, Steadfast Baptist Church, you know, before he became pastor, he was down at Faithful Word with me, and we were both part of the congregation together. And I'll tell you what, a man, that, a guy that's got zeal, Pastor Romero's got a lot of zeal for serving God. I love that guy. He's one of my best friends. He was one of my best friends down there. And um, when we were both just attending church there, I remember, and I'll, I'll never forget this too. It, one of the things that he did with me, he challenged me. He says, hey, let's go out soul winning every day for a whole week. He says, let's see how many people we get saved. He's like, just you and me. And we didn't go out together. We lived on opposite ends of town. He lived on the west side. I lived on the east side, way apart from each other. But he said, let's just, let's just do this. Why? You know, it's, it's something that we wouldn't normally have done just on our own. But he had this zeal and he says, you know what? Let's do, you know, you and me, let's do this. So it'll be like a challenge. Like, let's see who get the most people saved. And it worked. You know, it's, it stirred me up. And I did. I went out and, you know, and we did even more for God. And because of somebody like that, you know, it affected me very well. And it helped out my spirituality and, and you know, seeing his zeal to serve God. And this is how we ought to be with other people. You, know, you don't even always realize how much of an impact something like that can have. I'll never forget it though. He may not remember this. I don't know. He, maybe he does. He probably does, but he may not. I don't know because he's already got such a great deal. But that impacted me personally, what he did. And hopefully me, you know, going out and participating and talking about also affected him just as much as it affected me. I hope so. But it's, it's a great, you know, Having that extra, because that's going above and beyond. That's not just going to the regular soul winning time. That's not just showing up for church. That's saying, hey, let's do even more. I want to serve God. Let's do that even more. And it's taking it up to the next step, taking it up to the next level. Are you zealous towards serving God this morning? We're going to see some more examples but having a zeal towards God is taking things above and above this, this standard or the average. You know, you have to ask yourself, first of all, is coming to church a chore or is it something you actually like to do? It is, I mean, even, that's, that's real basic, right? I'm not talking about going out and, light, and lighting the world on fire. I'm just talking about uh, just showing up for, for a service. Showing up and coming to church. Is that a chore for you? Is that something that you feel like, Oh, tomorrow's Sunday. I guess I got to go to church. Or, you know, is that the way that you view it? Now, if it is, you ought to go anyways, but that's a heart problem. And you're the only one that's going to be able to fix that. 
And the only thing I could suggest, if that's, if that's your case, and if you have a problem with even going to church that you don't really want to, you need to just bear through it and, and you know, get in your Bible more and pray because honestly, there's something wrong with your heart. You, you, you might not be, have the right focus. Um, you might be a little bit too focused on yourself. I'm not sure exactly what you know, an individual's problem might be, but that is definitely a heart problem. You ought to be, you, you're going to want to get to the point where you like coming to church. Why? Why should you like coming to church? One, because of everyone that's going to be there, right? Everybody else who's a like-minded, I mean, your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's like, you know, most people, there are some people who don't want to go to church. They love going and seeing their family, right? You love seeing your, your, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother spending time with them. Why? Because they're your family, because you love them, right? Well, you ought to want to go to church to see your brothers and sisters in Christ and be like, man, you know, Miss Joyce, I, I, I miss you. I, I, you know, I, I, I've been, you know, I want to know how you're doing. Brother Sebastian, I want to know how you're doing. You know, I want to come to church because I want to know how is everything going. I enjoy seeing you because I care about you because you're my family. These are things that, that you ought to want to do and not just have a drudgery. Oh, I guess, you know, man, word of truth, Baptist Church, they got two services on Sunday. Pfft. I don't know about all that. And then another one on Wednesday? Eh, I'm not, I'm not going to do all that. Look, I like what the Bible says in Psalm 122. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That's only one reason to be happy too. You know, hopefully you enjoy learning. Hopefully you enjoy when we go through all the scripture that we read and expound and just look at this and say, you know, this is what God wants us to do. And hopefully you're learning and growing that way. Hopefully you like coming for multiple reasons. Hopefully you like coming to see, hey, what can I do to help somebody else out? Hopefully I, you know, you're, you're saying, man, I, I want to grow and do more. And ultimately, I love God. I want to sing praises unto his name. I want to tell God how great he is. I want God to bless me. But, but more importantly, I love God. And I want to do what's right. So I want to just get in church. But that's, a base, that's not having zeal. That's just showing up for something that, you know, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. But the goal is, is to be able to have that, that desire to want to do more things and, and, and to get that zeal. I think about, what about when you're on vacation or when you're out of town? Do you, do you take a vacation from God? This is something I decided a long time ago that when we go, we've, we've been on, on plenty of vacations with my family, especially before, well, more a little bit more so before I started pastoring, but um, you know when we would go out on vacation, we go out with our family. I don't just stay out of church because we're on vacation. I don't do that. I mean, how horrible that be! If God's blessed me enough to take the time off of work to spend time with family to go out and do all these other things, am I just going to say, "Oh well, thanks God," but you know I'm I'm a little bit too busy this Sunday. I've got I've got a, a tour that starts right at church time that's going to take me around and, and show me the history of this city. Or, you know, it's like, really? Where are your, your priorities? Just because you're out of town, I don't think that's an excuse to just, to just stay out of church. We don't take vacations. You know, we don't even take vacations from, from going soul winning and serving God. And I don't think that anybody should. I, I think that's something that should just be part of your life. I think that God should be a big part of our lives. Amen. And going and, and whether you're out of town, whether, you know, whether you're somewhere else, hey, find a local assembly of believers. I love, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm completely honest with you. I love going and checking out new churches. I love it. I love when we go on vacation and we find, let's, you know, obviously we try to find the best one. We want to find someone who's right on doctrine, right on salvation, of course. You know, a King James only, you know, independent, fundamental Baptist church. And we go out looking for these. I love meeting those people in different churches because not all churches are the same. In fact, I don't know any independent, fundamental Baptist churches that are the same. They're all different. They, you know, all the people are comprised are uh, different personalities and, and you know, maybe a slightly different view on things, but, but, Brothers and sisters in Christ, I love being around that. And I love getting to learn to, to know other people in other areas and just in, in doing that. And that's, you know, just a start. 
hopefully to get your heart right to want to serve God even more and to have that type of an attitude towards God and towards serving God. Let's look at a few more examples. Turn back, if you would, to Numbers 25. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers 25. We're going to see a few examples in the Bible of people who had zeal. Here's another example. Now, again, this is one that, that is a little bit bloody from the Old Testament, but this is a man that's recorded of having a great zeal. And because of that zeal, because he went above and beyond, God blessed him for it. God blessed Jehu. And, and you know, I didn't go through this in 2 Kings, but as we read the whole chapter, because Jehu served God, and, and it was what he did was verified by the Lord, that, it, that what he did was right. You can't question whether or not, well, should he have had Ahab's children killed? Yes, he should have. Because God blessed him for it. At the end of the chapter in 2 Kings 10, where we read earlier, God said, because you've served me, because you've done what I, what, you know, what I wanted you to do, you are going to have children on the throne to the fourth generation. God bless him in that regard, saying, because you've served me in this way, your children now, you don't have to worry about someone else coming over and taking over the kingdom. They're going to be in charge for four generations to come. That was his blessing unto him. He did that which was right. But look at Numbers 25. We're going to read in verse number 1. The Bible reads, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, now look at this, we see you know, that the children of Israel are committing this great sin. They're starting to worship these other false gods. And, they're committing, and it starts off with them committing whoredom with the daughters of Moab. So they start off by, by taking these, these heathen women, unto them to wife or concubine or girlfriends or whatever, but they're committing whoredom with these daughters of Moab, which God already told them not to do. He said, don't get yourself yoked up with these heathen women, with these unbelievers, because they're going to turn your hearts away from serving the Lord. And the scripture says that. He says, you know, and that's why today, as a believer, you shouldn't get married to someone who's an unbeliever. Because you may think that you're going you're gonna to do them good, but more likely than not, they're going to actually do bad for you more than you're going to do good for them. They're going to bring you down. It's a lot easier to bring someone down than it is to lift somebody up. So we don't get married and be unequally yoked with unbelievers when you get married to someone. Just as you know, we have these same examples in the Old Testament where God told them not to marry the heathen women. And he warned them and said, they will turn your heart against God. That's exactly what happened with Solomon, as I mentioned earlier. He married these heathen women, these Egyptians, and you know, just, just, just women from all over the place that didn't serve the Lord. They had their own gods that they worshipped and served. Solomon married them. He said, whoa, but I love them. Right? I, 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 he married them in love. I love this woman. I just want her to be my wife. And what happened? They turned his heart away from God. And he built altars unto these false gods to, to make them happy because they turned his heart away and God punishes them for it. But they did exactly that. And this is the same thing that we're seeing here. Israel begins to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And then the next thing you know, they're, the people are they're offering sacrifices unto their God. They're bowing down unto these false idols. And God has to judge them. Look at verse number 4. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. So he's saying, you need to take the heads of these people that are, that are, that are involved in this, and you need, to, you need to kill them, you need to hang them up. For all to see, that's what he says, in the sun, against the sun, in the daytime. Make, sure, make this public. Make sure everybody sees this in order for God's wrath that was against them for turning their back on the Lord and going and worshiping these false gods. He's saying, my anger is against all of Israel. You need to take the heads of these people and put them up. Verse number five, And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men 
that were joined unto Baal Peor. So Moses takes the command of God, says it unto the men, and look at what it says in verse 6. We're going to see here Phineas. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So these, you know, there were some people who were upset and they were sad because all this, this uh, sin was going on and God's judgment came and, and it came down that, hey, their brothers had to die. They had to be put to death because of what they had done. And this guy brings out this heathen woman. Just brings her right out in the midst of Kyrie. He just brings her to church, being like, like it's no big deal. Just boldly in his sin, going out and bringing this woman out in front of everybody. He says, even in the sight of Moses, just not hiding it, not covering up. Right after this happens, he just bring, waltzes out his, his, his heathen wife, which made God so angry. Verse 7. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. 24,000 people. God had this plague going through the children of Israel. 24,000 people died because of this sin, because they were turning their backs on God. They were serving these false idols. That's a big deal. There's a, there's a big judgment coming against the, the, all of the people of Israel because of these people who were sinning. So when Phineas sees, you know, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You're bringing that person here? You know, there's people dying all around us. And he takes up a javelin. He, just, he takes it and, and ends up killing both of them and executing what God had already ordained needed to happen. So he's not just taking the law into his own hands. He's not just being this vigilante. This was a commandment of the Lord, but he's saying, I'm going to do the commandment of the Lord. I'm not just going to hear it and say, yep, that's what needs to be done. He says, I'm going to do it. And it's not pretty. It takes guts. It takes courage to go and do something like that. But he went and did it. It says, so the, so the, the plague was stayed. So God saw that. And when that was done, that's a major statement that was made. We are not going to tolerate this. And we're going to obey the Lord and listen to what God has to say. The plague was stayed, verse number 9, and those that died in the plague were, were 24,000. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned, away, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel. He's, he's given the credit to Phinehas. He's saying, because of this one man, my wrath is turned away from the children of Israel because of what he did. And this is the influence and the impact that one person can have. One zealous person willing to serve the Lord, willing to do what it takes to serve God, was, was able to save who knows how many other thousands of people because of the plague that was coming upon them. Phineas was the one that turned away God's wrath. It says, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore, say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. He was willing to pick up the javelin in a time when it needed to be done, when God's judgment needed to be executed. And he says, because of that, I'm giving him the covenant of peace. And, and he blesses him with that, verse 13, and he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. There's a man that was zealous. Now again, you know, our zeal towards God is not going to be in the same manner that it was in these Old Testament stories. We're not going to be picking up javelins and killing anybody today. Okay, that because, and simply because of the fact that that is not what God's commandment is in our life. It was at this time the commandment of the Lord to, to execute this, this punishment, this judgment. That's what needed to be done. And Phineas did it. But the, the zeal of one man influenced so many. Turn if you would to John chapter 2, because Jesus was a jealous man. 
While you're turning to John 2, I'll read for you from, uh, from Isaiah 59, which is another passage talking about Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 59, 16, the Bible says, And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness had sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Talking about you know, this, this attire, this uh, figurative attire that Jesus put on. He was clad with zeal as a cloak. And the cloak is the, the last thing on the outside. Something that everybody sees. You see that zeal. He put on that zeal for serving God. And Jesus, I mean, no one could argue that Jesus Christ was zealous towards serving God. And the amount that he did and, and, and all the stories that we read about all the things that he did. But look at John 2 verse 13. We're going to see here an event where Jesus becomes very zealous. The Bible reads, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So Jesus walks into the temple. He sees the people in the temple selling, you know, and they were selling, there's nothing wrong with what they were selling, the, the actual animals that they were selling, because they were all they were selling animals that were for church. They were for the sacrifices. It was for a godly thing. So the object isn't what Jesus got mad about. And in this account, in this story, this is even different from the other one, it doesn't say anything about them being thieves or stealing anything. That's not, he wasn't mad about them ripping people off. That's not what got him angry. What got him angry was they were making God's house, which is supposed to be a house of prayer, a house of merchandise. And what's merchandise? Is there anything evil or wicked about merchandise itself? No, not at all. Merchandise, you, I mean, you purchase merchandise all the time. You go to the store and you buy your food, you buy anything, it's merchandise. You're buying something. It's, 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 you go to the merchant and you give them money and you buy whatever it is that you need. That's merchandise. But the problem that he had was they were doing it in God's house. In the church, they're selling things. And you say, but it's for church. That's, you know, I'll tell you what, that's why we don't sell any of our Bibles. We don't sell anything in here. Any of our materials say, yeah, but it's for, it's for God, it's for the church, it's for serving the Lord. I don't care. We don't make the church, the house of God, a house of merchandise. And we see this is an event where it specifically says, you know, Jesus Christ had this zeal. He made a whip. That's what a scourge is, a whip. Jesus Christ, picture this, Jesus Christ walks into the temple. He sees this going on. He sits down. He makes himself a whip. And he drives the people out. Say, get out of here. What are you doing in the temple selling stuff? And tips over their tables. And the money, you know, money's going all over the place, the animals. And he's saying, you know, getting a whip. Get out of here. Get this stuff out of here. It doesn't belong here. It's one thing to know something's not right. And to just keep that to yourself. Like, well, man, those people shouldn't be doing that. And you just walk on by. It's another thing to be zealous and to do something about it and to say something about it and stand up for what's right. I believe there's a lot of people in this country that know, in general, right from wrong. They know what the Bible says about stuff, but they're too scared. They're intimidated. They don't have boldness. They're not filled with the Spirit to, to just call it out and start taking action. What we've seen in all these, these, these um, instances where the Bible refers to someone having zeal, we see action. It's not just your desire, it's what you do with that desire and, and going out and serving and doing even more. Jesus Christ took it upon himself to make that whip and to drive him out, flip over the, you know, make a big event out of it. Make a big deal out of it. Because he was zealous towards God and he did not want to see that happening. You know, um, Phineas was zealous towards God and he did not want to see God being disgraced by this man after God just said, you know, not to have anything to do with him. You know, these people are zealous towards God and they're doing something about it. 
Now, in Romans 10, we, we have this warning. We need to make sure that when we have our zeal, that we do it according to knowledge. In Romans 10, verse 1, the Bible reads, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. This is the Apostle Paul talking about Israel, saying, look, they're, they're not saved. They're, you know, they don't believe on Jesus Christ, but I really wish that they would get saved. He says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, just like he did. The Apostle Paul, before he got saved, he had a zeal for serving God. He was going out and, you know, he really believed in what he was doing. And he was persecuting the church and arresting people. And he thought he was doing the right thing. And he had this great zeal and he was taking action and doing things. But it wasn't according to knowledge. That's not what he was supposed to be doing. He had this zeal and was doing stuff, but it wasn't right. There are many examples of people that have a zeal towards God, yet are not pleasing in his sight. And the Jews are a perfect example of this. They had a great zeal to serve God, but they weren't pleasing God, even though they had that zeal. You know, what the Apostle Paul was doing wasn't pleasing to God before he got saved and got right and was doing what God actually wanted him to do. The Bible says in Hebrews 11:6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It's impossible to, no matter how much zeal you have to be pleasing to God if you don't even have faith, if you're not even saved. But let's say you know, there are a lot of people out there that are saved and they really want to serve God and they have this heart and they think that God may even be calling them to say, let's just say they're, you know, they're being called, they feel like they're being called to pastor a church. They're saying, you know, I really want to do something great for God. I have a zeal, I want to serve Him and I think God wants me to pastor a church but they ignore the qualifications. Maybe they have something that's keeping them from being a pastor. Maybe they've been divorced already. Maybe, maybe something else, you know, they, maybe they don't have any children. Maybe they just want to, they just want to pastor a church. They want to do what's right. You know, the Bible says that it's, um, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. It's a good thing to want to do. It's a good thing to have that desire to do that. But we must make sure that we do things lawfully. They, you know, people will act on their zeal oftentimes and without using knowledge. <clears throat> there are pastors out there that ordain themselves, that have never been ordained. And I preach an entire sermon about, about pastors being ordained. The, the, how scriptural it is that, that somebody, that the church, that other people are able to observe, hey, this is a man that's, that meets all the qualifications. He's judged by other people, not of himself saying, hey, I fit the bill. I'm going to go. I'm going to take this honor on myself and I'm going to anoint myself and I'm going to go out and start this church myself and send myself out. Now, people like that, they have a great zeal. They're taking action. They want to do something. But it's not according to knowledge because it's not the way that God said to do it. 2 Timothy 2.5 says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. He's saying, if you're, if you're really trying to do this great work and you're striving for the mastery over something, you're not going to achieve it. You're not going to get that crown. God's not going to bless you. He's not going to give you that reward unless you do it the right way. Do it the way that he wanted you to do it. The, the King Saul was a great example of someone who wanted to do what was right. He wanted to offer up that offering because Samuel wasn't there and he wanted God's blessing. He wanted God to be with them. And he offered up his offering, but it wasn't his job to do it. He was actually going against God's word by doing that. He had a zeal for God, but it wasn't according to knowledge. We need to make sure that we have that knowledge and that what we want to do is actually right. You know, a lot of people out there are spinning their wheels trying to serve God because they're not taking the time to find out what is the right way to do it. How should I be? How does God want me to serve Him? People say, oh man, I want to serve God so much and I want to do all stuff. And they come up with these ideas which sometimes are good ideas, sometimes are bad ideas, but the only good ones are going to be the ones that are found in Scripture and if you do things the right way. Do things the way that God has planned out for Him to bless them. Now, Turn, if you would, to, to Titus chapter 2. It's the last place we're going to turn. We're almost done. I'm going to wrap it up with this. Titus 
The goal this morning, and, and you know, hopefully God's using this message in your heart to, to stir you up. I want to see more people getting on fire for God. I want to do more. I want to do more for God. And I would like to be able to affect you through my zeal. But I want you to be zealous for serving God. And, and I'm telling you, it's going to be infectious. And this is what God, God wants us to have zeal. And we're going to see this in Titus chapter 2, verse number 14. Talking about Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. God wants us to be zealous of doing good things. We ought to, to want to do good works. I remember a conversation that I had with Pastor Anderson in, at Faith Forward right, right after I started going to that church. Shortly after, I was going to, to Faith Forward. And we were just having a conversation. You know, we were chatting after, after service. And I mentioned how you know, my favorite book of the Bible is a book of Acts always has been. It's my favorite book of the Bible because I love all the things that they did. I love reading about these apostles and they went out, you know, after Jesus Christ was, was resurrected and they're going out and they're doing things for God and, they're, you know, and there's all these amazing changes that are happening and people are listening to them and they're getting saved and people are being healed and there's all this power and there's all this great things going on for God and I just love that book. It gets me excited when I read the book of Acts and seeing all these things happen. And I said, I said to, pa to Pastor Anderson, I was like, you know, th that's why I like it. It's exciting. And I said, man, wouldn't it have been exciting to have lived during that time? You know, these, they're turning the world upside down. They're making, doing all these great things. I said, it would be great if we could have something like that today. You know, wouldn't it be great? I mean, that was them. It would be great to, to see that again today, to see people turning the world upside down. And I, I loved his response, and I don't remember verbatim, but he basically said, well, there's no reason why we can't do that. So let's do that. And that stuck with me over all the years. That hit home to me, is that, you know what? This isn't a dead book. This isn't just a history book. This is a living book. God's word is active. God is active. And God is just waiting for people to offer themselves up and to say, God, here I am. Send me. God, I want to serve you. He has all the same power that he did 2,000 years ago. It's all there. But he's waiting on us. We are the ones that hold God back. He's not limiting himself. We are limiting God. Let's not limit God. Let us, let's be a people who can turn this area upside down with our doctrine, with our, with our zeal, with how much we want to serve God. Let's show this town what it's like to serve the Lord with all of your heart. Helping people, preaching the gospel, and doing what's right. zeal let's get zealous about serving the Lord as far as I have a word of prayer dear Heavenly Father Lord we thank you so much for those great examples in the Bible of people who served you and went above and beyond the, what, what most people consider normal coming to church is considered normal even showing up for, for the soul winning times dear Lord that's normal help us to have a zeal to just want to, to go above and, and do way more than anyone might ever, you know, quote unquote, expect out of us. Lord, I know that everyone in this room truly loves you and wants to serve you. Help us to identify the, the areas in our life that we need to work on more, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just lead us and guide us and teach us from your holy word that we could just really turn this world upside down with your doctrines, with, with your beliefs, with the truth out of the Bible, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.